All right, so quick show of hands. Who here is from Austria? Beautiful. How about uh, Europe, rest of Europe? Awesome. Anyone from the US? All right, well, uh, we're using metric, so uh, it's going to suck, but um, <laughs> Wi Fi is good. Chat GPT will help you. And if you just update it to iOS 18, it's all included. You can now use calculators on your iPad. Life is good. This is really a kind of talk that you want to start with, you know, like having a smoke machine when you come out. Turns out firefighters have ideas about that. Couldn't do it, couldn't get it approved. But that's cool. Uh, we'll still do it, we'll still make it interesting, and we'll focus on the, the non burning part of it all. So, good morning. Thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Kareem Satirli. I'm a senior developer advocate at HashiCorp, where I focus on infrastructure and orchestration tooling, teach people best practices kind of you know, help them set up platform teams, don't get paged when stuff breaks, it's beautiful. Uh, before that, I worked at the Amsterdam airport in an industrial IoT. Not as glamorous as people make you think, um, because IoT is also sewage pumps, uh, and that's not the stuff you want to be thinking about. But if you have any thoughts about the talk, comments, or you have really good chocolate cake recipes, I'm missing one of the hidden ingredients of the Sacher Torte, I'm at Case Atelier everywhere, so let me know. So, I was gonna say like a third of you raise your hand. We're in Austria, so let's talk about foosball. Or soccer, for the one uh, person that's uh, not using metric. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So, standard foosball pitch. Weirdly enough, I, honestly, I thought it was gonna be 45 by 90 meters, which is what I've been taught as a kid. I grew up in Villach. Uh, if you're from Austria, you know the place. Actually, it's probably not true. Uh, nobody knows that. But um, turns out it's a range. Uh, so we'll go with uh, 75 meters um, wide by 100 meters long. But for this exercise, we're not going to just need one field. We're going to need a couple of them. Um, to be precise, three rows of 11 fields. It's a lot of teams. Weirdly enough, despite all the money they make, they still only have one ball per field, despite people being able to afford more. But uh, all those fields together, 250,000 square meters. If you're from Vienna, uh, that's about was it twice the size of Stadtpark. It's big. You might be wondering, why are we talking about soccer? I'm here to talk about firefighting. So, close your eyes for a second and imagine the equivalent of your monitoring software going off in your camp or your Feuerwehr Kaserne or incident room, whatever you want to call it. You send out on a fire that you have to fight in a place called Man Gulch in Montana in the United States. And um, as you gear up, fire keeps going, of course, because the fire does not have the time to wait for you and the fire keeps spreading. And soon, these 60 acres will be gone, devoid of any life, devoid of any fuel, which is the primary thing a firefighter is concerned about. But the fire is still hungry. 60 acres turn into much more. It's mid-August. Temperatures are nearly 40 degrees, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, perfect conditions for the fire to spread. By the time you make it there, those 33 fields turned into 3,000 acres. It just keeps going. For context, imagine 3% of Vienna going up in flames. And your perfectly fine plane is heading right for it. And just thinking about it gives me a little bit of chills and I've worked on this talk for a while. It's still crazy that people do this, right? But. We can't stop there. Fire doesn't stop, fire doesn't care. 3,000 acres turn into 5,000, and by the time it's all finished, life is not good. Cost was high. Out of your team of 15 people in the plane, 12 don't make it back. There's a fair chance you didn't make it back. And so, in the world of critical systems and safety engineering, it is commonly accepted that regulations 
are paid for in blood. That is, a regulation nine out of 10 times is a direct result of an incident or accident, usually one that claimed lies. It's a bit of a downer, but the good thing about this is we can learn from this. Now, here's the thing. Many beginning operators, and you, know, you see this a lot with um, young site reliability engineers, young as in like early in their SRE career, early in their operations career, not necessarily young as in young humans. We'll tell, all these folks will tell you, you know what, the better tool is the better tool. Tenured operators, seasoned craftspeople, will know that the best tool you can have is a strict set of rules. And so, Will and his firefighters know this too. They have this uh, little thing here where they codified every rule. Looks like this. Goes into your pants pocket. 120 pages of incident response. Perfect playbook to have with you to memorize to do everything you need to do. Best part, freely available. You can download a PDF, can even get the printed copies. People will ask you why you're ordering it if you're not a fire department in the US, but it's all available. Fits into your cargo pants, can even double as a pillow when you get three minutes to relax. Gets refreshed about every four years, but the thing that's really interesting, there's 10, orders of firefighting in there that have been around for forever. These get drilled into you in your training. You get them in the book, you get them everywhere. They're also made available on small, nice little cards that you can have stickers that will be available everywhere. I've got one here for you if, um, if you have a really good question. And these rules have been around since 1957. The only thing that changed was the ordering to make them slightly more understandable. Let that sink in for a second. Think of any protocol you worked on that has been around that long. I haven't worked on anything that, uh, that has, stood, uh, has stood the test of time like that. So what I wanna do in the next 35-ish uh, minutes is look at these rules, at these orders, and see what we can do with that. This is not a firefighting course in the traditional sense of like, hey, something is burning, we're gonna fix that. That's something you wanna talk about, definitely we can do it afterwards. This is firefighting from the perspective of operations folks and building reliability into your system. And the word system here is really, really interesting. The rules, of course, are kept short. You gotta imagine people that have to read them, have to memorize them, they don't have time for 20 word sentences. Most sentences are really, really short. Most sentences just use the word fire, when technically most of these rules apply to fire systems, which is what you'll find in literature. Difference between a fire and a fire system, I was told by a former firefighter, is that a fire is something you deal with at home. A fire system is you should not be around. It's something you should not be around for because it will screw you up. And it's usually a bad time. So let's start with um, order number one. Keep informed on your systems, conditions, and forecasts. Three pillars of observability, right? Everyone knows these. And yet, as an industry, despite all the tools we have available, we still can't replicate everything our system is doing synthetically and then base information around that and extract information from that. And the problem with humans is when we lack data, we go back to gut feelings, right? Well, I think it will be fine. The server should be able to handle that load. Our clusters should be able to handle that load. But relying on your gut is something you should keep for baking gingerbread cookies, not for dealing with infrastructure outages. And so as we establish a base, uh, based understanding of our running system, let's look at order two. Think of this as your larger system. What's going on? Is there actual weather impacting your infrastructure as we've seen 
earlier this week. Uh, the Wiener Linien had to shut down a couple of subways. Uh, earlier last year, what was it, uh, June, I think April um, 2023, Google dealt with a little bit of rainfall in Paris and flooded a data center. And we learned that uh, region isolation is not actually geographically region isolation because water still screws you up. And there's a lot to learn from that. Are there larger factors impacting our system that we're not seeing? Your monitoring tools might tell you everything about your infrastructure, but are they keeping in mind everything that's happening around the more global setup? Talk about multi-cloud, but we don't talk about multi-clouds, the, the actual clouds that are you know, pouring down rain and um, giving us a lot of sewage to deal with, which our pumps couldn't handle. True story, Amsterdam Airport. Smoke bad. So, at any point your team has an incident, you should be able to know how your system reacted in the past, how it's going to react. None of this should come as a surprise because, well, you did your testing, right? You did your game days. You created hypotheses after the previous attack, after the previous outage and you verified that they are no longer an issue. If you didn't, that's okay. Now is a great time to start. There's plenty of tools around this. Look at the CNCF landscape. Just for chaos testing, about three to five different tools. Game days, funnest event you'll have at work. And for the managers in here, people will usually stay two to three hours longer. Think about the value you just created for your company by ordering two extra pizzas. I hear the chuckle. There's definitely some managers in here. Love it. Validate everything that's happening and then have retrospectives. We all always like to say, you know, like we want to learn from our mistakes and we want to make new and interesting mistakes. But if you see the outages that happen, uh, let's take was it two months ago, somebody pushes a wrong update file, my plane gets delayed, my daughter doesn't get to see me, that was a huge inconvenience. And you know, also to the other 17 million passengers that couldn't travel that day. It's hard. It's really hard. But we can do better. We have to do better. And I think that's, that's the more important part. And just looking around the room real quick, without wanting to aid you all, of course. Uh, most of us look like the kind of folks that, you know, we started in an era where our website was either online or offline. Either the Perl script worked or it didn't, and that's cool. Maybe it was PHP, sorry for that. But there was no graceful degradation. We didn't have partial outages of our website. And these days, we can build for that. If your website is having an outage, try to see if you can build it in a way, sorry, not the outage, build the system in a way that you limit functionality so that everything else can keep working. If your shop's checkout functionality can keep working, but you have to sacrifice gift card generation, I guarantee you there's nobody in your company that will ever go like, well, you know, like I'd really like to sell gift cards instead because gift cards are just a cost center for you because it's money that you owe somebody. But checkout means money you get. Money you get to hire more people to deal with the next outage. You need to have playbooks for that. Um, and more importantly, you need to have playbooks to deal with the whole incident. The biggest part there really is knowing what to communicate and when. That's gonna be a little bit of a theme. It's gonna come back. Communication is critical to all of this. When firefighters deal with these rules, they have to learn them to the point where you're on a 120 hour deployment, you get woken up after four days. Well, it's a lie. You're not gonna be woken up after four days. You'll probably have been mostly awake after four days. Somebody will quiz you on what the fourth order is and you have to recite it correctly because everyone else needs to know that you know what to do when Isht hits the fan. 
But when the fire is burning, it's already a little bit late. When the fire is heading towards you, it's a little bit late. That's why we have smoke detectors. That's why we have other options. So even before you have incidents, and, and we work in an industry where we can have stuff like this, have setups around that can help you with that. Honey pots, honey tokens, there are many ways to make this happen. Have a protocol that knows how to deal with this. There's nothing more rewarding as an engineer than to build a honeypot system that you see gets picked up by potentially a state actor because they're really, really interested in breaking into your system because you can learn from them. But we don't always get lucky and have to deal with foreign state actors. Sometimes the attacks come from within. So know what you're doing actually makes sense. Firefighters use a system called a controlled burn where they will torch something so the fuel gets used up before the actual fire comes around. If you don't know what you're doing, all you're doing is starting a second fire. Problem is, if that fire is behind you, you just cut off your escape zone. So don't do this if you don't have enough staff. And since we're talking about staying awake for multiple hours, multiple days, people get tired, right? Incidents drag on, tired people make mistakes. And it's not just a mistake of mispronouncing something. I mean, that's always hard. Most of us probably work in a company where they don't speak their native language. That's a huge burden on your brain all the time. So if you're an incident commander, and it's really not as fun of a role as it could be, keep folks motivated. But don't just keep others motivated. Don't just keep others engaged. Also make sure you are still able to engage properly. Work on training your staff up to be able to handle incidents before the incidents strike. Uh, in sports, we call it train like you play. Don't hold back. In your training, if you don't feel the same stress, if you don't feel the same need to change your t-shirt because uh, you just sweat through everything, then your training was not pushing you. Which means you're gonna have that stress moment when the actual incident happens. And that is definitely not when I want to be thinking, it's like, should I be doing this or that? So put yourself in a situation where you can uh, trust your training and answer questions like, how do we do X, Y, and Z? By simply pointing at documentation. Tech Talks come, what's going on, is going on. Documentation is hard. Documentation is hard to write. Documentation is hard to keep updated. But luckily, we have tools that can help us with that. And for all of us who have early career friends who want to get into tech, docs is the best way you can add value to a team if you have no understanding of anything else because you get to learn it all and validate it with everyone else. You're creating value for the whole group, making yourself indispensable. What's not to like? But on one side, when you have somebody who knows it all in a good way, a team that knows how to handle every incident, there's nothing more damaging than an incident where nobody knows what's going on. Let me ask you this. Anyone here ever have an incident where they go like, well, I thought I could fix it in five minutes? I mean, I've, I've definitely have had those. Uh, obviously not me, but my colleagues. Uh, five minutes turned out to be five days. Turns out when you delete an EBS volume that was completely filled with data, it does actually take some time to refill it with data. And that was a problem because we thought we could fix it much quicker. So we skip all the initial steps of, well, let's declare an incident. Let's make sure people know. Let's get the right people on board and informed so we can deal with that. And that's a little bit of a problem. There's definitely text on the left side for me here, or supposed to be, but apparently you're not getting it. Um, that's because we're doing 10% off today. Sorry about that. So declare incidents early and often. And depending on the company you work for, get your corporate communications people involved. There is nothing 
sadder than have to respond to tweets and toots and, and other messages on social media that got out before you got your stuff out. You want to have a good story ready, and it should be part of your playbook. It should be a template that you can fill in like, hey, we're experiencing this, we expect it to be done by then. People like that. If you tell me you'll have it fixed in 90 minutes, that's cool. At least I know I can come back and purchase the stuff that I need to purchase in two hours. But I'm not left trying with um, the checkout button. And so, while you're talking about comms, corporate communications, and just team-wide communications, the other thing that's really important is making sure when you give out orders as an incident commander, or any role that is able at that moment, uh, moment or elevated to give out orders, that these orders are well understood. cost of repeating something twice is definitely lower than the cost of replacing a cluster or even rolling back a multi-cluster change. And the more important part here is when you dole out those orders, even if it's in chat, make sure they're written down and permanently available. If we all agree that we're rolling back to version 1.1, from the current 1.5, that's okay. We just need a written record of knowing when it happened with the timestamps. There's plenty of commercial tooling available for this, but it doesn't have to be commercial tooling. Sometimes something as simple as is it, um, Etsy's morgue, not the most marketing friendly name, but great for incident reports, will help you figure stuff like this out. Know what happened when so you can reconstruct the timeline because that's what you're going to be using in your training. That's what air traffic control does to train up new people. It works for them. It makes that industry one of the safest, provided you can find enough screws and nuts and bolts to you know, make sure your doors don't blow off. But there's a lot to learn from that. And as you get tired, make sure you have a buddy around you, somebody that knows who you are and how you work. Pilots use that system, soldiers use that system, works for them in stressful situations, it will work for you. We've all been, sorry, we all have had colleagues who've been that hotshot that was like, oh, I can fix this, I don't need you to look over my shoulder, only to then fumble with some drop down, some command, and instead of rebooting a server, deleting it and causing more of an outage. We, we want to avoid all of that. Which brings us to order nine. <clears throat> and this is a personal favorite of mine. When you have a problem, sometimes it's really, really easy to get focused on one thing. You zoom in on it, you think, hey, you know what? This is something I want to be doing. This is what I want to be focusing on. This is what I want to be solving and nothing else matters, right? Your disk is full. Your network connections are dropping. Your network connections are only coming in from one region but not from all. It should be a simple fix, right? Because for the longest time, we've been taught that root cause analysis is singular when really it is very much a plural thing. We need to dig deeper. There's always a bigger issue. Are we not able to connect to that zone or is that zone not able to connect because the actual physical line is severed? We've had diggers. I've worked on a system where a digger literally killed one of our backup lines and it triggered in the weirdest way because we had rotating um, power tests, power backup lines, sorry, uh, power tests, and it would only trigger you know, half the time. We could not figure out what because, well, the system itself was reporting everything correctly. And we focused too long on that to not realize that in the meanwhile time, our backup batteries were not properly charging because we couldn't get any connectivity. When you find yourself in a situation like that, 
it gets hard to zoom back out, which is why you need to work with a team. Be methodical, don't overextend your team, and work smooth and not fast. Because smooth is fast. The less mistakes you make, the, slow, the, sorry, the slower you go, the less mistakes you'll make. And the less mistakes you'll make, the better the outcome, always. And that really brings us to the last of the 10 firefighting orders as we apply them to systems engineers. Protect your system aggressively, your systems. If you need to terminate features, like we talked about in order four, do it. It is more important to retain some control than to lose it all. Best conference talks are, hey, we had a massive outage, but we were able to keep this thing going. It's also a morale boost, right? We're all humans working on these things. If we see our whole infrastructure board light up like the reactors in Chernobyl, the series, not the actual Chernobyl, that's not a good feeling. The more stuff goes down, the less personal success we feel. There's a really great study on it that looks into the stress operators in our jobs, but also in places like um, fire dispatch and ATC, air traffic control looks at, where all of us have the psychological profile to take a lot of this stuff personally. Hockey players, interestingly enough, same way. Not my hockey team from Fila, because they seem to not be able to win for 25 years, but I think that's a different thing. We see this happen all the time. Imagine you're trying to solve this little buggy updated file that was just sent out without proper testing. And instead of being able to rescue a thousand computers, check-in computers that broke, it keeps going. And you're seeing 10,000 go down, 100,000. And now nobody's able to check into your airline anymore. We've also seen the same stuff happen when ransomware strikes. Know how to protect your system. Know which parts you need to shut off. Because sometimes you don't get lucky. And when you don't get lucky, you might find yourself in the same situation as Maersk did, where their whole network was encrypted with ransomware and the only backup they had was in an offsite location in Africa and the person that had to travel with the hard disk did not have a travel visa. True story, uh, not Petya. Uh, and it was resolved, but only by sheer luck that they shouldn't actually have had. You don't want to depend on luck. Luck is really, luck and hope are really bad strategies. They're really great stories. But there's a 50-50 chance that if you depend on luck and hope, that you might be somebody else's great story instead of your own. So don't do that. There's a lot that we can learn from established industries that deal with safety systems, critical systems, and engineering systems. And these 10 orders are really just a basic inspiration and pointers on where to focus your reliability efforts. And that really brings us to the underlying theme here. Systems reliability at its core is a product of a well-structured command and control function. We use words like incident commander and incident manager, scribe and everything. And if you take a look at the words being used, we almost feel like a militaristic word choice there. There's a reason for that. We know that that order works. We know when it, uh, shit hits the fan, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to make sure that we have somebody that we can trust. We want to make sure we have somebody who knows what to do. Because if we're all wondering, should we roll back? Can we roll back? What happens if we roll back? We're depending on luck and hope. A team that knows how to listen and act is really a team that's going to win. And to achieve this, all incident helpers, everyone in your team, your current shift, 
the upcoming shift, everyone else, requires strong situational awareness. You need to be able to know what's going to happen before it happens. Because a lot of times with our systems, we can predict it. If NASA can predict what one of their probes is going to do on touchdown, I'm pretty sure we can figure out what happens if we scale to a region we've never been to. But strong situational awareness on its own depends on something even more important, stronger communication. Bless you. I know anytime uh, somebody tells me, well, you need to be a better communicator, I, I get sneezes too. But there are no shortcuts here. It, it really is this. So rather than leave you with 56 different links to GitHub profiles, tools that you can download, I want to leave you with one very simple thought. Systems reliability stands and falls with your team's strength in terms of communication. It is never too late to get better at this. And if you feel that your team is absolutely horrible at communicating, that's okay. You can change that. As you get more advanced in your career, as you become a better engineer, you'll learn that lines of code is no longer important. Lines of chat messages on the other side, especially if they're good chat messages, definitely help. So if you find this subject interesting, and given that except for this one person who really had bad taste, everyone is still here, there are two books I think are worth uh, reading. Uh, Rob Schnapp and his team wrote Incident Management for Operations almost seven years ago. You might think, well, who are these people? Uh, I met Rob and his team a while ago, and the way they describe themselves is they're the kind of firefighters that you call, that other firefighters call when they don't know what to do. Uh, think power plant that's burning, nuclear power plant, massive chemical spill. Uh, think Google SRE versus uh, I run my own website on a Raspberry Pi kind of level of difference. And they work with organizations like Flickr and Google and others to build this book, codify their knowledge, and link it to what we do in our field. Very, very interesting. And of course, I mean, who doesn't love a good war story? Uh, Evers Peterson's Fatal Defect looks into the personality, the personalities that play a role when you're debugging systems that can have, where bugs can have fatal effects. Book itself has been out for a while. So of course, you know, Y2K is no longer a concern for us. It wasn't a concern back then either, but Thank you. Really appreciate that one. Um, but the approach these hunters take to find those bugs and make sure they don't affect people down the road are really, really inspiring. And just think about the person that writes firmware for a pacemaker. Man, word the fatal bug really takes a different uh, meaning in that case. So with that, some reading material for you. I've got some time for questions, but so far you've all been wonderful. Thank you for the chuckles. That's all I have for today. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll have all the slides up on uh, speaker deck. So um, if you took pictures, There'll be a more high-res version of them available later. I do appreciate the quietness, which always makes me think it's like, okay, there we go. So one, let me first repeat the question. So how do you know 
playbook one, which works for incident X, is good for incident Y. Is that a good summary? All right. The way we look at this is pretty much like a readme in our GitHub repositories. Uh, and I speak for the we as in pretty much my whole career of any time we've had to deal with uh, system outages. We have a readme that looks at the prerequisites. You know, your GitHub repository might say, well, you need JQ and curl and whatever else installed. Our playbook might say, this playbook is only applicable for this kind of thing. We shamelessly stole that from firefighters where they say, this kind of attack for the fire is only relevant if the fire is of this type of liquid or this type of uh, chemical. Uh, so the prerequisites need to be met before that playbook gets into play. Of course, in a stressful situation, that gets a little bit annoying. Um, last time we built tooling around that, something like, well, we used Angular back then because it was a while ago. These days, you know, basically a drop down where you fill in a couple of things and it points you to the right file. Um, I'd wrap it in a backstage plugin these days just to make sure my documentation is as close to the system that's generating it. But that's really it. So we have wizards that you fill in uh, think Clippy for incidents. Hope that helps. Yes, please. So one time I was in the incident where I was part of one part of the sysengineering team and they had a disaster in another area that was outside my expertise, but they were having a huge issue. Do you have any advice for dealing with something where you're causing big problems that is very much outside of your uh, Ooh, that one is interesting. So just to go, um, summarize, an adjoining team had an incident that you were called in to fix. It wasn't something your team or your product caused, and you also weren't trained up on knowing how to fix it. At that point, if you're trained up as an incident commander or in any incident management role, the best role you can do is to help them guiding their efforts and making sure the methods are correct. You might not know, you know which service to restart, which binary to remove, which binary to update, which command to run on the CLI, but you should still have knowledge of the methods that your team uses in a similar incident. Definitely, here's the sad side about this. When stuff like this happens, if you do it wrong, we all know we've been in those teams where those teams will then blame you for doing the wrong thing, despite you being the person that was never trained up for it and they should have been able to do it. So instead of making it a they versus you, they versus them uh, approach or versus us, help them use the right methodology and go from there. That's, I think, really the best uh, thing you can do. But also, once the incident is done, look at the notes together, understand why you were called in, why that team was not able to solve this on its own, and what you can do in the future to make a situation like that either not happen, or that when it happens, your team also is able to lend help. Uh, if we bring this back to firefighters, I saw somebody with a laptop with uh, uh, California on here. You'll see California having fire season happening, there'll be firefighters from all over the US because they use a standardized system where you can request somebody from New York to come over and they will understand exactly how to help. They might not know the exact type of tree that's burning. That's not relevant. They know how to lend help. They know the methods and the process. And that's really, I think that's really, really crucial. Good question, by the way. Yes, please. Yeah, so you were saying that uh, this relies on strong communication, right? So what if you're trying to get uh, like managerial or an executive buy-in to see how important uh, like stronger incident management is? And you were mentioning, you know, like documentation, communication, like things like that. What do you recommend when starting, not only to convince your team, like start that conversation, but also working on implementing that? So, 
Great question. So how do you get managerial buy-in? Is that the, the underlying? Um, yeah, yeah, with managerial buy-in and getting started, getting the ball rolling, essentially. Uh, so I have a background in marketing. Um, one terminology we really love to use there is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And execs are really, really uh, prone to that. Show them an Excel sheet or Google Sheets, whatever you use, that quantifies the cost of an outage. Nobody wants to go to their manager and have to tell them, like, well, yes, I had the information, but I didn't act on it because it was more important for our team to ship new features instead of build a reliable system. It's kind of roundabout that we have to go about it this way because we all should be working in a way that solves the reliability issue of a product rather than you know, creating perverse incentives where new features are the ones that get you promoted. But the reality is uh, it's a dirty game and by playing it ethically, you're gonna lose. So really just modify it in your way and win that way. Um, quantifying outages is really, really easy. Most companies have something like Tableau or Looker that will tell you how much you're earning in an hour. Get that data, put it on a nice, overview and go like, hey, 12 hour outage, that's about 1.5 million euros lost. Uh, oh wait, sorry, it's for uh, the Christmas period. That's actually 2.7 million euros lost. So you tell me, do you want my team to build this feature or do you want my team to work on that? Uh, that's the initial buy-in. And then there's nothing better than to meet execs during an incident, because everyone wants to be in there, everyone wants to be the hero, especially if they don't have to do anything. There's nothing more rewarding, and I get this from uh, one of our incident managers um, at HashiCorp, than seeing your team do all the hard work, and you looking great because of it, because the incident was properly declared, everyone got involved, the execs could jump into the chat and see what's happening see it getting fixed, because everyone knew the role they had to play. I mean, it's great for you, it's great for them, everyone feels nice about this, plus your name gets circulated in front of the VPs, in front of the directors, in front of everyone else, which is never bad for your career. Because, um, well, shit rolls downhill, but before that rolls past you, it has to go past your manager. So um, a failure in reliability is your manager's failure, but a win in that area is your team's win. It's oversimplified, happy to talk more about it because I see we're out of time, but definitely, definitely convinced with data. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Thank you, everyone.